Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host Peggy Mello. Today's guests are Christina Santiago, the Hospital and Community Services Specialist for the Center for Donation and Transplant. We also have Joe Camella, the husband of an organ donor, and Greg Satterley, an organ recipient. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Christina, we're going to start with you. Do you want to um, talk about the uh, Center for, Do for Donation and Transplant, what's the background of it? Well, the Center for Donation and Transplant, it's the local organ procurement organization in the area. Um, we cover 30 counties, all the way down to Catskill Regional Medical Center, um, Binghamton, and uh, all the way up to the Adirondacks, and that includes um, six hospitals in Vermont, one hospital in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, there's 59 OPOs throughout the United States, and we are the facilitators through organ donors and the transplant recipients. And what's an OPO? An OPO is an organ procurement organization. Oh, okay. And it's a nonprofit, right? Correct. Okay. Um, let's talk about numbers. Numbers. Everyone always loves 000. to hear numbers. What's 98,000? There's 98,000 people currently waiting for a life-saving organ in the United States. Um, and the list just continues to grow. Uh, two years ago when I started, that was only at 93,000. So um, it continues to grow and it always will grow. There's an average of um, every 14 minutes someone new is added to that waiting list. Mm -hmm. And about every, seven, um, every day about 17 people are taken off the list due to death and they didn't receive a transplant. Okay, who is eligible to be an organ donor? Well, we'd like to say everyone's eligible to be an organ donor. We don't want people to automatically rule themselves out because of one reason or another. Right. The criteria is always changing. Um, but for organ donation, there is certain criteria that does need to be met, and that's brain death criteria. Um, it's very hard for some people to understand brain death when given the situation because um, it's a very tragic accident usually that happens. It's something that's un unexpected. And um, brain death criteria is um, it's someone who is legally declared dead, but by brain death criteria and some clinical criteria where they check the brain function. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard for families to understand that sometimes because they're on a ventilator. Right. Uh, the tube is the intubation. Chest is the chest the is rising. Is the skin is warm. It looks like they're breathing. Um, mm -hmm. Some people can confuse brain death with a coma. They're two totally different things. Um, a coma, you still have brain function, and um, with brain death, there is no function to the brain. Okay. All activity in the brain has stopped. And just to be clear, it's any age person. Any That's age. Um, donor, right? It is organ donation with the Center for Donation and Transplant is upon death. So um, we do evaluate at that time if someone is an eligible donor. Um, we have had organ donors that were in their 80s um, as young as um, a couple days or weeks old. So mm -hmm. there really is no age for organ donation. Okay. And or you don't deal with live transplants. Like if somebody is giving one kidney and to another? Yeah. Um, okay. We're. Right not involved in that situation. That's with the actual transplant centers. Um, there are um, Albany Medical Center, which is in our coverage area. They have a heart transplant program, a, a kidney transplant plant program, and a pancreas transplant program. Um, Fletcher Allen Healthcare Center, which is in Burlington, Vermont, has a kidney and pancreas transplant program. Um, they're the ones who would facilitate uh, living donations okay. if someone were to be a living donor to. Now, yes. you've mentioned a few of the organs that yes. can be transplanted. Do you want to just do the list? Of sure, organs? I can do the list. A lot of people are unaware of what can be donated. They usually think kidneys, and, and it's funny when you're speaking to children that are in seventh grade, they often say brain. Can you donate your brain? And um, unfortunately, you cannot. <laughs> um, there is um, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and intestine. So it does equal eight due to the two lungs and two kidneys. They can um, be separated. And uh, a liver can actually be split mm -hmm. and given to two recipients as well. Hmm. So. Okay, and you also deal with tissue transplants. And tissue. do you want to talk about what tissues can be transplanted? Sure, tissue donation. Um, you can donate your corneas upon death. Um, corneas, bone, skin, heart for valves, um, veins, uh, tendons, 
all that stuff can be donated and um, at, at the time of death and it's used for a multitude of things and a lot of people one organ and tissue donor can enhance or save the lives up to 50 people mm -hmm. So UNOS is part of the process. Do you want to talk about what that is and, and what they do? Sure. UNOS, um, it's the United Network for Organ Sharing. Um, they monitor the organ procurement organizations throughout the United States and make sure that we're doing what we are supposed to be doing and following um, their rules and regulations. Um, they are the ones who maintain the computerized list of patients who are waiting. Um, we have nothing to do with that on our end. We just type in the information when there is a donor into UNOS, and um, we then print out the list of people who are waiting and start with number one on the list. So they're in charge of um, listing the criteria of who gets put first and who gets put second, and how, is, how are people listed on the list. Hmm. Okay. And what is, what is the process that somebody goes through? Let's say they get a bad diagnosis from, from a doctor and they need something transplanted. Um, what, what's the process? Well, if someone does need a transplant, I'm sure Greg can talk about that a little later since he's um, experienced that firsthand. But usually you would, most commonly, you start with your primary care physician. Something's wrong. You don't feel right or... Um, and they go from there, and then they would get listed through their transplant center. Um, unfortunately, around here there is no liver transplant program, so you are traveling down to Boston or um, the New York City area, um, Buffalo, Rochester type area. So there is traveling that is involved because there's not always a transplant center around the corner. Um, and as far as for the donation side of it, that comes from the hospital. The hospital will refer the um, eligible donor to us. We are separate from the hospital, but we do work together with them. Okay. We're going to move to Joe. Yeah. Um, you are a volunteer for the Center for, for Donation and Transplant, and you also lost your wife um, as well. So do you want to talk about your story? Well, the, the fact that um, my wife and I discussed the, uh, the possibility uh, that one of us may at some point in time predecease the other one and, and our uh, organs could be used by a recipient. So we discussed that several years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I would suggest that to anyone who feels compelled to come on board to donate their organs because you know af after all we don't know when we're going to die we can't predict what's going to happen and under what circumstances and it's not a maybe it's a definite it is a definite <laughs> you're all right about that okay you want to uh, talk about what happened to your wife well my wife was uh, in a car accident in a car accident and under those circumstances she had severe um, head trauma um, ironically there wasn't uh, anything wrong with her body except uh, uh, we had a situation where uh, the trauma was severe and uh, she was kept uh, alive on uh, life support systems. Mm -hmm. But I want to stress to people that the fact that we discussed that possibility years ago right. made myself and daughters comfortable when we were approached by the individual who, who represented, it, mm -hmm. uh, represented uh, the center. Because that's going to be and, you know, I really hope that no one goes through anything like that. I pray that no one goes through and that. I imagine if you're going through it, you don't want to have to be able to make those decisions at that time. It's a difficult decision, but we've always been uh, rational under those circumstances. It was uh, uh, hard to explain. Uh, you're sort of in a fog. You really can't connect the dots. And, and uh, the fact that we discussed that sooner made it easier. Uh, to, to give the go-ahead for that. And, of course, I, um, I went ahead and asked my daughters, too. We had to have a unanimous vote on that. Uh, but I know my wife, uh, under those circumstances, she was always a caring, loving person and did a lot of volunteer work mm -hmm. in, in other aspects, not for the center. And that our goal was that if we could help other people in death, because our faith is strong, uh, uh, and we just think that our spirit inhabit, inhabits our tabernacle or, or our body right now, and why not help other people? Okay. And how long was she on life support before uh, you were approached? I think it was two, you know, it's still a little hazy for me, but I think it was two and a half days or three, three days, something to that effect. Yeah. Okay. 
And do you want to talk about where, what, what organs uh, were donated and where they went? Yeah, now, uh, we made the decision on, on the organs prior to, uh, prior to that accident, obviously. And I was unaware that there were other things that we could have donated. So, you know, education is very important when you come to this decision. But uh, my understanding is that her um, heart went to um, a man in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And... Um, kidney went to uh, a single mom in Vermont, another kidney to someone in the New York City area as, as well as her liver. Her lungs went to a 52-year-old man in uh, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't know what this, the circumstances are, but I, I did hear that he had been bedridden for a few years and, and couldn't walk or get out. And both her corneas went to, to California, and um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you can, as a, in a donor family, you can, if you wish, to write these people anonymously mm -hmm. and hopefully start a dialogue. Uh, I have not received any information back, as, but when you talk to Greg, he'll, he'll be able to, he made contact. I think that, for me and my family, would be a wonderful thing to know that, uh, in part, part of her still exists and still lives on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll make one little sidebar on this. I mentioned before, she, she loved to dance. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if this guy in Pennsylvania who got, his, got her heart uh, feels compelled to go dancing on mm -hmm. Saturday night now. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, it makes me in, in a very bad situation to look back and, as you can see, to smile, to know and chuckle a little bit that she's helped other people who up until that point had some kind of uh, fear on what was going to happen with their future. And just to be clear, you, cho you chose to, to uh, contact the recipients, right? You've, I you've did. written all of them anonymously. I wrote them anonymously, yes. Uh, that's the process. Christina could probably get into it a little more detail. But, uh, uh, and then it's up to the recipients to contact. The, the center, isn't that correct? It is. Um, it's sometimes difficult. Um, We've had letters from recipients three days after their transplant that just want to say thank you, thank you. And um, sometimes it's hard to call a family member to see if they want to receive that letter. It's, it was so soon. Mm -hmm. But that is the process for a year. Um, there's um, communication through the Center for Donation and Transplant anonymously, just leaving out where you live exactly in a phone number, um, where you're from. And um, we facilitate that. And if after a year, if they both have stressed uh, interest in meeting each other or having direct communication, we will certainly go through with that. But that's our policy. Um, mm -hmm. I will say, with speaking to some recipients, it's, it's sometimes hard for them to say, how do they say thank you? It's hard. Right. How do you grasp that fact to say thank you? Because they are under the impression someone had to die for them to live. And I've never experienced that. But I know that it could be a, it's hard on their end. Mm -hmm. I can understand that, and I, I, you know, I don't feel that they're obligated to contact me, as long as they're living a, a, a great life and they can enjoy their family. Uh, I would like it, but it's not, you know, it's not an important part of. It. Now, Joe, you talked about um, the process of why why planning is so important. Um, do you, do you want to talk about what somebody has to do? Well, to do the planning. Well, first of all, I think Christina can has a, she's a little more updated on, on what uh, how you can do that process. I, I do know that you can sign the back of your driver's license, mm -hmm. but that doesn't always that doesn't always work. You still need the consent of the immediate family, mm -hmm. and we're in the process of having a, uh, a registration. Correct. Process. There is currently a New York State registry. Um, the registry is actually a registry of intent at the moment. So if someone signs up on the New York State registry, um, they're expressing their intent to donate upon their death. Um, in June of 2008, New York State will be implementing a registry of consent. So that would be first person consent for someone to consent for their own organ donation. Um, Right now there is a legal hierarchy, and um, if someone is not on that registry of consent, we do go to the legal hierarchy, and that would be um, its spouse, um, adult child over the age of 18, 
parents, siblings, and then other. And that legal hierarchy is who the legal next of kin is, and that's um, Mr. Camello was, was offered the option of um, consenting for donation for his wife. Okay. So now we go to Greg. <laughs> um, you want to talk about your story. You were healthy, and then what happened? I was a um, very active person, and one Monday morning I was at work, I was having a hard time swallowing, and I looked in the mirror, and my eyes were starting to turn yellow jaundicey. So after four days, I got into my doctor's office. He did some tests. And at first, I didn't know what was wrong with my liver. Actually, they didn't know what was wrong with me at all. Mm -hmm. So over the next couple of weeks, I did more and more tests. And then one Friday afternoon, I was at a golf tournament, golf, and I was in excruciating pain. So I left the tournament, I went to my doctor's office, I walked in his office and said, today you have to do something. Mm. I said, I can't keep going like this. So he admitted me to Alice Hospital overnight, and he, uh, our, my doctor already had a patient in Boston. So after they ref he referred with his colleague, they um, referred me to Boston. The next day they um, moved me by ambulance. The doctor said they'd be there as soon as I got there. I got to Boston at midnight. The transplant doctors were there to do the first test. They told me to be back in the morning to start more tests. Through the whole day on Sunday, I went through tests, many tests, because they have to, first they have to find out what's wrong with you. Then they have to evaluate to see if you're sick enough. And then they have to evaluate to see if you're not too sick. There's um, a lot of criteria that goes into it. And on Tuesday morning, the doctor came in and told me that I was a candidate for a liver transplant. And the first question you asked him is, well, how long? He goes, well, I can't tell you that because I can't predict when somebody's going to die. All I can do for you, I can right. put you on the national registry, and it's a waiting game for us. So did you have to um, carry a pager around? or? No, after they told me I need my done. transplant, they kept me right in New England Medical Center. And um, I had to stay on mm -hmm. um, all the monitors because that's one of the criteria. And um, they told me on Tuesday I needed my transplant. And then on actually Saturday morning at 5 o'clock, the nurse woke me up and said, there's a possibility of a liver coming for you. So now all the tests that I went through for the whole week, I had to go through all again in a matter of four hours because now they had to, had to evaluate me to make sure I, my body wasn't too sick to... So is it just general things like EKG, blood work, X-ray, that's it? X-ray, CAT scans, blood work, um, just about any test they have, you had to go <laughs> through it all over again. So it was the space of how much time from the first doctor's visit to the transplant date? Was it a month? 28 days. 28 days. From knowing that I was sick to when I had my transplant. And um, when I had my transplant on that Saturday, it was a 12-hour procedure. When I woke up Sunday morning, I knew whatever they did was right because my whole body felt totally different. For once, yeah. I could finally feel like something was actually working inside of me. And when they took my liver out, it was 90% deteriorated. It turned rock hard like a football. And I had a young transplant surgeon, and he... Um, that was his joke that, oh, after we took your liver out, we use that in a, a wire for football while we were waiting. <laughs> so how do you feel now? I feel great. I do everything I did before, and um, I went back to work after eight months. And um, within a month, I knew that the doctors in Boston did a great job. I had no side effects or anything. I was out doing just about everything I could. And That's great. The biggest thing I wanted to get back out golfing. And the doctor says, well, your body will tell you. Do what you need to do. He goes, if you do too much, your body will tell you. Are you taking medic medications every day? Yeah, I take um, a morning dose and an afternoon dose of anti-rejection drugs. And those I'll be on for the rest of my life. For the rest of your life. Because even though it's a new liver, my body will always say it's foreign because it didn't start out in my body. Now, I understand that um, the, 
person that donated everything, there were actually more than one person received organs, right? Yes. And have you had contact with the family at all? Yeah. Um, my donor was an 18-year-old boy who died in a motorcycle accident. Wow. His mother, Carol Ann, wrote me a letter two months after my transplant. She wanted to find out who I was, how I was doing, because in the meantime, when my transplant happened in Boston, the um, other hospital that's next to where I was mm -hmm. had received four of the organs, and they did a quadruple transplant on four different patients all at the same time. So it became a very big story in Boston. And through that, a People Magazine reporter picked up the story. Mm -hmm. And the mother wanted to contact us all before any reporters did. And now to this day, I email Carol Ann almost weekly. Oh, that's great. So she knows how I'm doing, because she told me that was her best therapy, knowing that Darren is still living on through me. I'm in contact with the gentleman that relieved received Darren's heart, who lives just south of Boston. When I go to my appointments, we meet for lunch, and he always calls me his little brother because he's a few years older than me. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Christina, mm -hmm. do you want to talk about myths about organ donation? What are some of the myths? There are a lot of myths that float around, um, and some people, I think, are hesitant to wanting to sign up on the New York State Registry or, or um, let their wishes be known about organ donation. Um, one of the, the most common myths is if I sign the back of my license or if I sign up on the registry that um, they won't do anything to help me if, if I were to be in an accident and have to go to the hospital, and, and that's certainly not true. Um, we're separate from the hospital. We. Um, the hospital's there as caregivers, and unfortunately we're there to give an, an option at the time of death that there's no other options available, um, and there's a poor prognosis. Um, that's one of the myths. Another myth is that I cannot have an open casket or go through the normal uh, funeral arrangements. If I'm an organ donor, I've listed that we take bones and heart for valves and, and eight organs that can be transplanted. Mm -hmm. um, there can still be an open casket, even with cornea donation. Um, <clears throat> there is no altered appearance to the um, patient at, at all with organ or tissue donation. Um, another myth is cost. There is no cost to the family that is giving. Um, it's called the gift of life. Um, it's called the giving life for a reason. It's, mm -hmm. it's a gift from that, that person. Um, there is no cost for the family if there is donation. A lot of times it happens because we run tests. Um, there's an extra maybe 24 hours worth of hospital stay after the time of consent to when um, actual organ donation does happen. Um, <clears throat> that is all paid for by CDT. And do you want to talk about why the month of April is so special? April is National Donate Life Month. It used to be a week, and uh, for the sixth year in a row, they've actually made it a whole month long, which has been very helpful because we, um, we cover, with our 30 counties, there's 46 hospitals. So it, it allows us to get into those hospitals, let the staff know that thank you for doing what you do because all, everyone is involved in the whole process. Even when working in a hospital, you can be involved in the organ and tissue donation process. So it allows um, us to let everyone know that to talk about donation with your family, and I'm sure that that helped that decision making a lot better for you, Mr. Camilla, with, with knowing, talking to your family about it beforehand and what each other wanted. So um, I always say this, and uh, donation is not for everybody. Everyone has the right to make their own decision that they want to make, but um, we're here to let them know about what that decision is um, or what their options are and um, talk to your family about it because one day they might make that decision for you. Um, you might make that decision for someone else in your family and it, it is easier when you know what they've wanted right. instead of compliment, um, contemplating what would they have wanted to do. Uh, did they sign the back of their license? Did they not? So mm -hmm. um, talk to your family about donation, especially in Donate Life Month in April. Okay. Uh, Christina, do you want to talk about volunteer opportunities with the center? There are plenty of volunteer opportunities at the center. Um, I do run the volunteer program, and if they do call um, the Center for Donation and Transplant, I'd certainly be happy to talk to anyone who's interested in volunteering. We have volunteers who come in and help with just 
daily office routine that help with um, mailings. We have mailings that go out and a, and a quarterly newsletter that goes out that needs to be labels put on and, and folded. So there are volunteers that come in and, and they sit in the break room and talk to each other and just go through and help us with our, our daily activities and help us out in the office. There's volunteers who like to speak publicly, as we have here, who don't mind getting on TV and um, answering a few questions and telling people about their, their story and their situation. Um, we have health fairs, and there's volunteers that man the booths at health fairs. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot to volunteer with, and I'm sure that, that Joe and Greg, who are volunteers with the Center for Donation and Transplant, can speak about that. Yeah. How they got into it. I, I, for one, would like to say that my first um, public speaking in front of a group uh, was a few months ago, and some of the people who were in attendance, when I described, uh, based on my, at the time, my limited knowledge and, and my experience about how they can help other people, came up to me and said, you know, after I got sp done speaking, they said, we want to sign up. I mean, this this is a great program, and if, mm -hmm. if it, I can help other people, I'd like to do that. And I was aware of, well, there was probably about 300 people in attendance, and um, uh, four people came up to me personally, and uh, the co-speaker, uh, I'm not sure if they anyone went up to him, but I, I think that's a good rate of return on, on awareness anyway, especially at, for that time of the year. And what sort of organizations or groups can get speakers? Well, this happens to happen to be uh, retirees from CSEA, okay. um, and uh, you can do service organizations like Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis or um, Elks Clubs. Uh, even uh, employers would uh, like to bring in, in some cases, uh, make an awareness to their uh, employees on, on how they want to go forward with something like this. So I think uh, our, our, our outlet is unlimited, to tell you the truth. We do. We have spo um, speak, spoken to uh, children in schools and attended some church facilities that would like to host a speaker if they do an event on Saturdays. Um, mm -hmm. It just uh, it, it's who we have available to speak, and if they're we can fill their date, I guess, and hopefully they're flexible. But anyone and who's willing to learn uh, more about organ donation and get the word out there to everybody, call the Center for Donation and Transplant. We'd be happy to speak to them. All right, and Greg, you're a seasoned volunteer. I've been what, volunteering. What do you do for the center? I've done almost every volunteer job that Center for Donation and Transplant had. I've been a volunteer since 2001. When I first went back to work, I contacted the Center for Donation and Transplant because I was doing a health fair at the prison I worked at, correctional facility. Mm -hmm. And Bill McTeague, who worked there, he sent me cases of stuff. And through the first health fair I did at the jail, I had 86 coworkers. Um, signed up to be on the registry. And I've done a speaking game at church. I've gone to numerous high schools and um, middle schools. And you can really see when I go to speak, the mood of the class changes. Like when Christine is there to speak, the kids aren't asleep. really paying attention. <laughs> but then as soon as I got up to tell my story that I was a, a living recipient, it, they would, on every word that you would say, they were glued right to you. Then they had very good questions, because even as young as the high school kids, there's a lot of high school kids that have tragic accidents, so it affects the younger generation too. Right. And they had a lot of questions, and two of the schools I went to was just after a tragedy happened, and the kids were like, yeah, we want to do this because Joe helped so-and-so, and, -so, and they all knew who the person was and who he helped. So it was really, you know, it really makes you feel good knowing that somebody had took the time to sign the donor card for me, so now it's my turn to volunteer and get the word out for more people to be aware so that the cycle can keep going. Absolutely. And we have a few websites um, and phone numbers to mention. Do you want to mention those? Sure. Um, the Center for Donation and Transplant, um, the local number, it's 518-262-5606. 
and um, 1 800 number 256 7811. We can also be reached online, www.cdtny.org. Um, there's a lot of information. You can follow personal stories, Greg's stories on the internet. Um, there's personal stories that are on our website. There's links to other websites that have helpful information about organ and tissue donation. Um, you can also sign up on the New York State Registry through our website. Um, we're available to answer any questions. Um, we'll always have um, reach out to the opportunity to speak to the community. If anyone is interested in hosting um, a booth during a health fair, uh, we have volunteers uh, that will are always willing to help and sit in on a Saturday afternoon or during the day. Um, we have health fairs. We have speakers, volunteers, and, and staff members that are able to speak to the community. And, and it is, you're right, it's, everyone needs to know about it um, in order to make that decision. And there's a lot of information out there. So Okay. Well, thank you all for coming in today. Thank you for having You're me. Welcome. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.